Good evening. My name is Olawumi Akinlimibola, and I'm a senior at Duval High School. I've participated in mock trial, um, soccer. I'm in the National Honor Society and the Italian Honor Society. I also participate in Peer Forward, which is kind of like a mentoring group for the senior class. And I also volunteer at Doctors Community Hospital. Um, I enjoy um, giving my time to other people. I enjoy tutoring and helping the people around me. I'm a QuestBridge finalist, which is like um, kind of a group for helping low-income teens get to um, high-caliber colleges. Um, my long-term goal, I either want to be a neurosurgeon or I would like to go into public health. Anything that deals with saving lives, that's where I want to go in the future. And um, I'm a proud senior at Duval High School, and, <laughs> and I'm ready to go to college. <laughs> um, now I want to welcome all of you to the April 25th, 2017 Board of Education meeting. Highlights this evening will include Newsbreak, um, celebrating the Teacher of the Year. Additionally, under the consent agenda, the Board of Education will be adopting the following proclamations. Um, National, Asian, and Pacific American Heritage Month, um, May 2017, and also National School Nurses Day as May 10, 2017. Um, please continue to check www.pgcps dot com for um, upcoming Board of Education meetings and events and also and now the April 20 now the April 25th 2017 Board of, Educa Board of Education meeting will commence. Thank you. All right. Good job. Good evening, friends and colleagues. Welcome to the April 25th, 2017 board meeting of the Prince George's County Board of Education. Let's again thank Olawunmi Akinlemi Bola for that great presentation today. <laughs> friends and colleagues, Olawunmi isn't ready for college. She's ready for Stanford, ladies and gentlemen, which is where she is headed with Har with Harvard as her backup plan if she is, is unsatisfied with that. Um, and so uh, great work uh, on her behalf and great work by the staff at Duval High School for giving her the support that she needed to, to succeed. Folks, before we begin our formal agenda, I'd like to remind you to please uh, turn off your wireless communication devices or put them on, on vibrate so that they do not interfere with the taping of the meeting, and I will ask Ms. Boston to please lead us in the board prayer and Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. O oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance. Steer us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Boston. Mrs. Parker, would you please call the roll? Thank you. Ms. Ahmed? Here. Here. Dr. Anderson? Mr. Blocker? Present. Ms. Boston? Present. Mr. Burroughs? Ms. Eubanks? Ms. Hernandez? Present. Mr. Murray? Here. Ms. Quintetos Grady, Ms. Roche, Mr. Valentine, Mr. Wallace, Present. Ms. Williams, Present. Dr. Eubanks. Present. Thank you. Colleagues, just a word that uh, Ms. Quintetos Grady and Ms. Eubanks are both ill this evening. Our thoughts are with them. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, Mary Roach uh, is a couple of days overdue for the birth of her child, which is happening any moment now. 
Uh, we prefer it not to be here, and so does she, so she is not with us uh, this evening uh, as well. So let's uh, keep all three of them in our thoughts. Uh, colleagues, prior to the adoption of the agenda, uh, please note that items 8.1 through 8.3 uh, have been removed. Uh, I'll, I'll entertain uh, a motion for the agenda if anyone cares to make it. A motion, but before, before we move adoption agenda, anyone want to move speakers? Uh, I'd like to move that non-agenda item speakers are moved up. Second. It's been moved and seconded to move non-agenda speakers up to agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed. Thank you. That motion carries. Colleagues, uh, may I please then have a motion to adopt the uh, April 17 board meeting agenda as amended? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Thank you. That motion carries. Colleagues, may I have a motion to approve the April 6, 2000. 17 board work session and April 12th, 2017 CIP committee meeting minutes. Second. Second, and I need an initial agenda before I, you, you want to move so it? Move, so All move, right, move it. Moved, moved and seconded to accept the minutes. Is there any discussion? Ms. Ahmed. Um, I love Mr. McCabe, um, but I don't believe he's a CIP director anymore. He's retired and he's in the agenda as having given the presentation that we had for CIP. So if we could just have that amended to have the proper names in place for those folks giving, agen uh, giving the presentation for our CIP. Who gave the CIP presentation? Lucian. Lucian Shaler. Lucian Shaler. Not Mr. McCabe, who's retired? No. He's been a, a yes, well, he's on the minutes as having given the CIP. No, it was Lu Lucian yeah. All right. and Shayla. All right, so we will make that correction to the minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Ms. Ahmed. Any other corrections to the minutes? Seeing that, we will, uh, we, will you renew those, that motion to approve as adopted, as amended, rather? Go ahead. Yep. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded to adopt uh, these minutes as amended. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Thank you. That motion carries. Colleagues, we'll now have a news break entitled Celebrating the Teacher of the Year. Devin, let me tell you a few things about her. She is originally from Ithaca, New York. She works at an Elks Lodge. She organizes events to support veterans. She's done this for the past four years. We thank you for your service. One by one, nine celebrated teachers stood beneath the glittering chandeliers of Martin's crosswinds to listen as their praises were sung, their careers extolled, and their nerves put on edge as they, along with their families and friends, anxiously awaited the decision on who among them would be chosen as Prince George's County's newest Teacher of the Year. You know, we can never pay you teachers back for what you've done for us. You know, your role as educators impacts every single student in this county. But before the revelation of the 2017 winner, there were tributes to all Prince George's teachers in Roosevelt High School step team's dazzling athleticism and in the poignant words of Amanda Espina, the reigning teacher of the year. This year has been a whirlwind and a tremendous opportunity for me to grow as a teacher. I was constantly surrounded by and in contact with some of the most innovative and more importantly, caring educators across the state of Maryland. They say the best thing about teaching is that it matters. And that the hardest thing about being a teacher is that it matters every day. Every single day. It absolutely does. Finally, with the four finalists and the audience holding their breath, the decision came on who would be Amanda Espina's successor. 
It is my honor and my pleasure to announce this year's 2017 Teacher of the Year for Prince George's County Public Schools, who I know will represent us well in the state competition, Carolyn Marston. Surprised and humbled at her selection, fifth grade teacher Carolyn Marsky nevertheless was clearly ready to be an advocate for the profession she loves. Mary McLeod Bethune is an idol of mine, and she often challenged her students and teachers, cease to be a drudge, seek to be an artist. The nominees in this room um, are the tip of the iceberg. There are so many artists in our midst in Prince George's County Schools. I am incredibly proud to be one of them, and I'm proud to represent great teaching in Prince George's County. Thank you so much for the honor. After 10 years of teaching history and language arts at Ridgecrest Elementary, Carolyn is now poised to make some history of her own as she goes on to compete for the titles of Maryland and ultimately National Teacher of the Year. The following shows why she has an excellent chance of achieving just that. Sire, is it wise to do this? I worry that the colonies will turn against us. Many Americans dislike our laws and regulations already. Shouldn't we abolish the tax on tea as a show of goodwill? You might not confuse a Ridgecrest Elementary School classroom for a Broadway stage, but these days there is a strong resemblance. For on the second floor, reading language arts and social studies teacher Carolyn Marsky is producing and directing Tea Overboard, the story of the Boston Tea Party with, and here's the challenge, players who have never acted let alone stood in front of a class. Did you enjoy playing Lord North for us for a few moments there? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I love seeing students who didn't know they had a skill get the opportunity to try it out and be good. I, I don't know if you noticed, but you know, there are a couple little guys in that play there that at the beginning of the year, they never would have come up in front of a class. Um, and they'd never had the experience of doing that before. And it's really fun to see them A, volunteer, and then B, do a really good job of it and, and feel good about themselves. I love that. Mrs. Marsky, who spent nearly 20 years doing research and analysis in the private sector and who holds degrees from Berkeley and Stanford, came to the classroom 10 years ago via the resident teacher program because when you care about children, as she does, just studying data doesn't do it. I think you can come to teaching from a lot of different backgrounds, but one thing I think I've brought with me that I didn't anticipate is I can tell the students, not just tell them why it's important to do this research and analyze and think and write, but I can share my own personal experiences with that because I did it for a living. From Carolyn's principal, herself a former Teacher of the Year, comes admiration for how Carolyn brings American history to life. They study the American Revolution and they'll cut, you'll come in here when they perform their plays and there will be rifles and there will be the Boston Tea Party enact, reenacted. So every day you walk in here, it's something different and it's just magnetic. She really exudes and represents all great teachers and that's why she should be the Teacher of the Year. But Carolyn knows that teaching is about more than just history. It's primarily about the human heart. My son came here in third, third or fourth grade, and he had trouble reading. Mm -hmm. He had trouble in math. Um, he had teachers in the past that were that uh, affected his self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And she looped with him fourth and fifth grade, mm -hmm. and she changed him. When they're nervous about something or worried or stressed, and you give them a little pointer, I, the way they relax. Oh. To see them and, and then try it and break it down for them, instead of a task or a school being stressful, it's manageable. Okay, I can do that. And then I know, you know, I've got something to build on. From Carolyn's newly confident actors come tributes to her personality and her patriotism. 
sentiments they didn't have to memorize. Well, she's a really nice teacher. When sometimes when I have a hard time, she encourages me to not give up. She's a, she's such a nice teacher. I wish I can have her for a sixth grade teacher too and for the rest of my years in school. Or do you feel proud to be an American because of this class? Yes, very proud. That's great. And I bet you're proud of Miss Mariski too. Yeah, I hope I hope she does a great job in being the teacher of the month. She actually could be the teacher of the year. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> All we have to say to the Broadway cast of Hamilton is eat your heart out. That's Carolyn Marsky, whose devotion to and love for teaching is no act. All right, thank you for that great report. Carolyn Marsky represents... Uh, the greatness not only of the 8,000 plus teachers in our county, but every one of the 18,000 education support professionals, principals, administrators, uh, and colleagues who each day commit to the education of our children. Uh, we thank her so much and we know she will represent us well when she becomes Maryland Teacher of the Year and National Teacher of the Year, we'll let you know. Uh, we'll move on now uh, to the chair's report. I will start, uh, as I always do, in honoring the life and memory of, of loved ones and those we lost. It's particularly difficult uh, this evening to share the losses of three of our precious middle school students. Uh, and we will remember their spirits. We uh, will grieve with their families. And we will make sure that they are not forgotten. Today we will give respect and remembrance to Kareem Hill of Stephen Decatur Middle School, Deshaun Smith of Ernest Just Middle School, and Olu Wati Milhane Faith Sunday of Kettering Middle School. Please join me in a moment of silence in honor of these awesome and brilliant lives. All right, thank you, family. We honor them in the work that we do each and every day for their fellow students. Uh, and in fact, I will talk about some of the outstanding work of some of those students right now. Uh, this year, Prince George's County Public Schools Science Bowl celebrated its 31st season, providing fun and exciting opportunity for students to shine in one of its pillars of STEM which is science. Glen Arden Woods Elementary School and Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School emerged as champions this year. I want to congratulate the winners to all who participated and to the parents. As a parent uh, of a winner uh, way back in the day of Glen Arden Middle School's Science Bowl uh, quite a few years back, uh, I know that uh, parents uh, and teachers and administration in, at uh, Glen Arden Woods and Martin Luther King Jr. could not be prouder for the brilliance uh, uh, of their students and, uh, and what they demonstrated in Science Bowl. Uh, the board would also like to congratulate Brandywine Elementary School on their new courtyard and outdoor classroom received through a multi-partnership initiative led by the Heart of America Foundation. We are truly grateful for the strong and robust business and community partnerships, PGCPS, has developed and sustained with organizations that fully support the goal of academic excellence in our county. Thank you to all of our partners who participated in this project. Walton, SNC Lav Lav Lavalin, Patuxent Companies, uh, Godelsky Materials, Aggregate Industries, NRG, PSEG, Keys Energy Center, LLC, Brandywine North Keys Civic Association, G.S. Proctor and Associates Incorporated, Denison Landscaping and Nursery Incorporated, Panda Power Funds, Proctor Landscaping and Masonry, Washington Gas, 
Prince George's County Public Schools and Prince George's County Government, as well as countless community volunteers. What, uh, as you see as I read this list, uh, what it means to have true partnerships with our community, with our businesses, in helping to make our schools more beautiful and more ready for students to learn. Uh, and at that, uh, before I conclude uh, my chair's report, I will, as I often do, give an opportunity uh, to share, for have one of my colleagues share uh, the great work that is going on all over the county as well. So I will extend a point of personal privilege to Ms. Mahila, Rahila Ahmed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Um, on April 12th, I had the honor of co-sponsoring a celebration at the Bowie High Annex called the Ninth Grade GPA Challenge. To give you all some background, a group of about five committed parents got together to pose a challenge to Bowie High freshmen for third quarter. And that challenge was to raise their GPA by 10% from second to third quarter. This small group managed to enroll over 100 students in the challenge, um, of which 30% met the challenge or maintained a greater than 4.0 GPA. Across the entire ninth grade, 210 students met the challenge or maintained a greater than 4.0 GPA across quarters. All were invited to a breakfast celebration where they received certificates and gift cards. So let me tell you, this is amazing. This, it's such a unique thing to see this level of grassroots collaboration towards student achievement and I want to see more. I wish and I hope that these types of projects continue at Bowie High and also spread kind of like wildfire across our different county schools um, because honestly I think it's what we need. I think it's important for us to encourage growth in our students and to empower those that are willing to take on that challenge. So having said that, I would like to acknowledge some of the Bowie High parents, students and staff in the audience that have committed to student achievement in this very unique way. Um, we have Mr. Lou Brown, who's a parent, uh, students Madeline, Kendall, and China, and Principal uh, Prince. Could you stand up so we can write? Mm -hmm. Principal Prince and Assistant Principals White and Four. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you for taking our, on the challenge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Ms. Ahmed. Uh, and thank you to the great students, parents, and staff at Bowie High School. Um, uh, upcoming meetings, uh, May 11, 2017. Uh, we have a board meeting at 5 p.m. here at the Sasa Building. Persons interested in speaking at the meeting, at the meeting of the board, must register with the Board of Education office two and a half hours prior to the meeting by calling 301 925-6115. This concludes my chair's remarks, and I will now yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for the Chief Executive Officer's report. Thank, thank you, Dr. Eubanks. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back from spring break. I hope everybody had the opportunity to relax, recharge, and refresh as we enter the final quarter of the school year. The park statewide, attest, uh, statewide assessments are currently in progress in our schools. Starting with third grade, all students will take the park assessments in core subject areas. Please check for, for test dates at your child's school and be sure that your child is in attendance. Ensuring students are well rested and have a healthy breakfast helps prepare them for success. As you saw in the news break, on April 11, we announced our new Prince George's County Teacher of the Year, Carolyn Marsky. Ms. Marski is an outstanding fifth grade uh, reading, writing, and social studies teacher who has served students at Ridgecrest Elementary School for more than a decade. She was selected by our Teacher of the Year Roundtable, and she will go on to compete for the Maryland Teacher of the Year Award. We wish her all the best in this endeavor. I'd also, though, like to offer congratulations to runner-ups runner Emily Freeman, special education teacher from Deerfield Run Elementary School, and other finalists, Karuna uh, Skaraya, a uh, national board certified teacher from Robert Goddard Montessori and Cheryl Strong uh, from Judith P. Hoyer Montessori School. Also, two Prince George's County Public School educators competed with local school districts for this year's Washington Post Outstanding Educator and Administrator Awards. Denise Dunn, principal of Bridgecrest Elementary School, was a finalist for the Washington Post Principal of the Year Award. And Maria Wood, a teacher at William Hall Academy, was finalist for the Washington Post Teacher of the Year Award. Both individuals embody the outstanding work being done to raise academic achievement for all students in our county. 
Next, uh, please take a moment next week uh, to thank all of our teachers during National Teacher Appreciation Week from May 8th through, through the 12th, sponsored by the National uh, PTA. This year's theme is Teachers Deliver. Share photos and activities using the hashtag, hashtag thank a teacher on our PCPS tw uh, Twitter and Facebook pages. Learn more at www.pta.org. Uh, uh, congratulations as well to Chief Financial Officer Ray Brown and his team. PGCPS was recently awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting by the Government Finance Officers Association. The Accounting and Financial Reporting Office also received an award of Financial Reporting Achievement. Congratulations to Peggy Harrison, Assistant Con Controller, and Quinetta Lawrence, Senior Accountant, who prepared the award-winning financial report. Mr. Chair, this concludes my remarks. Thank you so much, Dr. Maxwell. Um, next up is the legislative report, colleagues. The legislative report is posted in board docs uh, for your review. We don't have a formal presentation. I believe Mr. Bias is available for questions uh, should they arise. Mr. Is Mr. Bias here? She Number is. One, Mr. Bias, thank you for the outstanding work you do for us in Annapolis each and every day and for your thorough and thoughtful reports. Thank you. Board colleagues, are there any questions about the legislative report? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to board committee reports. I will now yield the floor to the chair of the Policy, Legal, and Legislative Committee, Mr. Curtis Valentine, for a committee report. And we will also hear from uh, the chair of the Board Governance Committee, Ms. Carolyn Boston. Mr. Valentine. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? It is very low. Um, Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Curtis Valentine. I am the chair of the Policy, Legal, and Legislative Committee. Uh, I'm here on behalf of my fellow uh, committee members, uh, my vice chair in her absence, Lupe Contreras Grady, uh, fellow uh, committee members, Carolyn Boston, uh, Dr. Beverly Anderson in her absence, and also uh, my colleague, uh, Kay Alexander Wallace. Uh, the general charge uh, for this committee uh, is the responsibility of ensuring that board policy legislation are focused on key areas of both impact and responsibility that will enhance print and community engagement. In addition, the committee will provide oversight of the legal services for the Board of Education and the Prince George's County Public School System and will ensure that policy is current, sound, compliant with state and federal laws, and consistent with best practices in high-performing schools. In addition, our committee will consider legal matters as appropriate and upon recommendation of our general counsel. Uh, as a committee, we established um, four priorities at the beginning of the year, uh, which we determined we wanted to review and assess uh, current policies or introduce additional policies, uh, whether it be through um, local uh, school board system or to make recommendations to uh, our delegation um, in Annapolis to have either countywide or state uh, bills introduced. Uh, those four priorities included student safety, student equity, student health and wellness and quality teacher pipeline programs. Uh, I'm happy to uh, just share some of the um, accomplishments of this committee to date. Um, one being a uh, thorough review of our board uh, handbook. Um, in doing so, we reviewed sort of the, the travel policy of board members as we go out uh, outside of Maryland uh, to represent our district at conferences, at different meetings, as we go out and to gain more information about how we can make our system strong. Um, we've also looked at other uh, aspects of the board handbook um, related to board meetings, how we conduct ourselves and make sure our meetings are timely uh, and efficient. Um, we also uh, conducted and created a legislative platform for our, uh, as you, you might have uh, just heard her speak, um, our legislative um, attorney to go to Annapolis and to engage with our legislators both from our delegation and to the state on our priorities as a system um, and we were very active in participating in this set, this year's session many of our committee members were in Annapolis testifying on behalf of bills that we supported and in opposition to bills that we opposed we also uh, myself and Kayla and Jenna Wallace uh, represent this board on the Maryland Associations of Board of Education 
um, legislative committee. And in that capacity, we also convey uh, the will of this board uh, to other board members around the state who then um, share their will with the state legislature as well. Uh, we also uh, did a review of the uh, minority-based enterprises uh, policy, uh, and that is how we uh, engage with minority-based or local-based enterprises here in, this, in our county um, to ensure there's equity. Uh, we have a date set for our, our first MC, MBE policy advisory board meeting in May, and something that we will, I, I will be serving as the board liaison to, something that we will continue to engage and update you on moving forward. Uh, we've also uh, made student safety at priority, as I mentioned earlier, and we are reviewing current policies related to student safety as it relates to the administrative leave that many of you have been hearing about. Uh, we, we, through that capacity, we're working with the administration in a couple of areas, particularly related to um, the rights of substitute teachers to have access to data, the right of teachers to communicate with substitute teacher um, in their absence, uh, but also um, the additional resources we can give to students who do have a long-term substitute to ensure that they're getting adequate, adequate teaching, excuse me. But also, lastly, how we're working with the administration to ensure we have timely case review of those educators who are on administrative leave. And so we're really busy. We meet on a regular basis. Um, all our meetings are public, and so you're all invited to come participate. Um, in many instances, we've invited educators and parents to come and engage in conversations with us around our policies to make them more efficient and more applicable and more practical. And so moving forward, I continue to invite you all to come out. Dates of our meetings are published on our website. If you have any other questions, you can email me or call me with information about how you can contribute to our policy committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Valentine. Ms. Boston. Good evening. Uh, first, I want to um, uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Brown and his team for the uh, uh, recognition that you got for your finances. So I want to thank you for that. Okay. So the members of the Board Governance Committee consist of myself as the chair, Mr. K. Alexander Wallace, Ms. Patricia Eubanks, Dr. Beverly Anderson, Mr. Christian Rhodes, who is the executive representative from the administration, Panasonic uh, facilitators, Ms. Erica Berry, who's our executive director, and Mrs. Uh, Brianna Woodson, who is our executive board uh, assistant on this. The charge of the um, Governance Committee is, the Board Governance Committee is charged with the responsibility of identifying or developing activities to increase the knowledge and skill sets of board members and providing guidance on the, on the governance of the board, which may include the board governing principles and commitments and process recommendations uh, for board action. Specifically, the committee will propose opportunities for education and professional development of the board, provide interactive opportunities for the board at least twice yearly with retreats, social activities, et cetera, ensure that the board remains in compliance with bylaw stipulations, and assist with communications among, among board members. Uh, since our last report, I think it was in November, uh, which um, the next uh, board meeting, uh, the committee meetings that we held began in January of 2017, um, the board committee met. Uh, we finalized plans for our February retreat. We set agenda topics for the retreat and held conversation on revamping and reorganizing our work session topics. The board retreat was held on February 3rd through the 4th. Uh, on day one is a two-day retreat. Day one session, um, agenda discussions where we agreed on building the framework for courageous conversation and outlining the benefits, obstacles, and steps needed to overcome those barriers. We reviewed uh, a Courageous Conversation, a book called Courageous Conversation by Glenn Singletary as a beginning for our discussion on equity. In the retreat, at the retreat, we, uh, the, I'm sorry, the retreat was facilitated by the Panasonic team who did an excellent job, by the way. The Board Governance Committee was charged uh, by the board uh, to implement and build a framework for further discussion on equity. The other 
discussion at the retreat was the CEO's administration's presentation on strategic plan outlining, outlining the partnership between the board and the CEO, uh, executive cabinet, and a brief update on implementation of that plan. On day two, um, updates was uh, from the board uh, committee chairs, which all the committee chairs, they discuss um, their committee reports in length, outlining progress, their progress to date, high level initiatives and actions taken to achieve the results. Um, we were also briefed, um, the board was briefed on uh, board operations with internal and external communications, agenda setting and all arguments. Our next meeting, which was held in March, um, the, 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 board, uh, the board governance, we started the framework for equity on the equity task force and uh, we discussed and did some implementations on that. The board governance recommended to the board chair and the CEO to establish an equity task force. The charge for the task force would be to recommend changes to and or the development of board policy and administrative procedures that would incorporate equity into the strategic plan. In April, the board committee met on April the 10th. The mission, we discussed the mission and the purpose and the objectives of the equity task force. Um, we uh, selected co-chairs uh, who were not, uh, the co-chairs were nominated. Uh, and we discussed uh, the agenda topics for our next board retreat, which will be on June the 16th and 17th. On April the 1st, we held the first um, equity task force uh, meeting. And during that meeting, uh, we discussed what the reports will consist of. Um, the board and the, the task force, uh, the equity task force will present to the board uh, reports on a monthly base, a bi-monthly. The first report uh, is due on April the 1st of 2018. The first meeting of the task force was held April the 12th at 9 a.m. and it consisted of the following members. Uh, appointed by the board uh, chair was Mr. K. Alexander Wallace, who was the co-chair of that committee. Uh, Mr. David Murray is on that committee. Mr. Nor Hernandez, Ms. Lupe Gutierrez Grady, Ms. Carolyn Boston. The administration was appointed by the CEO, Mr. Kristen Rose, who's the co-chair, co Ms. Lisa Price, Ms. Nora uh, Morales, Dr. Gladys Whitehead, Ms. Janice Briscoe, and Tom Mr. Tomas Rivera. And that is in our report, respectfully submitted. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boston. And thank you, committee chairs, uh, for the leadership work that you do and every one of our committee members for uh, the time and effort that you put into making sure that we continue to do uh, our due diligence and work really hard on behalf of this system and the students that they serve. Thank you for that great, those great committee reports. Uh, colleagues, we will now move on to our public speaking uh, of uh, non-agenda items. We don't have any registered speakers for agenda items today, and we have 10 speakers registered for non-agenda items. Before we begin, just a couple of notes on how the process works. Uh, you must speak on the topic for which you've been registered. The board will not address the comments at this time. At the sound of the buzzer, which uh, is three minutes, and there's a clock uh, to your right as you're speaking, uh, please complete your final sentence and wrap things up. You may not relinquish any part of your speaking time to another speaker, either registered or unregistered. Uh, you're encouraged to use titles rather than names, for example, board member, CEO, et cetera. Uh, and please do, if you have written comments, leave them uh, in the file box located next to the microphone. Your adherence to these guidelines will enable the public comment process to move smoothly. So we will begin this evening. We have registered first. Mr. Jonathan Abraham to speak on Mount Rainier K-6 language immersion.
Okay. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, uh, I'm come, I've come here again from Mount Rainier uh, to speak on a subject of uh, K6 uh, language uh, immersion. Can everybody hear me? Okay. And uh, the between the time that passed, the last time uh, that I came out here, we, I had consulted with uh, uh, the representative from uh, District uh, 3, which is our district, and uh, we had consulted, uh, begun a conversation on this idea of language immersion along with the immersion program that is already ongoing, uh, I understand, uh, you know, at the board level and at the administration level. Uh, I had a chance to visit Cesar Chavez Elementary, and uh, that was a great experience, seeing uh, how the concept worked, uh, how in three or four different classes, being able to look and uh, speak with the students and uh, the teachers and see how the engagement levels were and uh, how that could play a part in playing to the strengths of some of the uh, uh, aspects of our community. Because in, 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 in many ways, I think uh, here in PG County, uh, in terms of the cultural mix of who we are, where we come from, I, I went to just uh, Langley Park over the weekend to do my shopping and I ended up in uh, a halal store for my uh, meats. I went to the Indian store across the street for my vegetables. And then I was at an international market that served uh, Asian and Latino customers, uh, all within the space of a half mile. Uh, and uh, this is where our greatest growing population, our greatest needs are for investments in the future and the education, not just of Prince George's County and the residents here, but also of the future of uh, the country. I think this reflects what America is becoming, who we are. And uh, I, I really applaud the uh, initiatives of this board in uh, seeking to do uh, tailored programs that like speak to things like, particularly when we come to ESL students or special needs students in ways that uh, help the uh, students learn better. Um, so both with Cesar Chavez, uh, and I would also commend uh, uh, the CEO in terms of the spotlight that's on us here in PG County, uh, in terms of his letter to General Kelly of Department of Homeland Security in really drawing a line of security around our students and our community and this beautiful new America that we're moving towards, trying to say that we will not get dragged to the past the fights of the 70 year olds are not gonna be our fights. This is the new America, those are the kids that we're gonna raise and from 2018, when my son who's falling asleep over there, Sebastian, enters Mount Rainier Elementary to about 2030 when hopefully he comes here and gives a presentation and says, hey, I'm off to college. Uh, I look forward to working with you during that time. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments, Mr. Abraham. Our next speaker is Phyllis Wright to speak on District Heights Elementary School. Good afternoon. My name is Phyllis Wright. I'm a parent of District Heights Elementary School. Today was a nightmare for me and the children and the staff there. There were some chemicals released from the school. I tried to encourage parents to bring their kids back, thinking that it was safe. There's not a safe environment for our kids to be there. There's contractors walking in and out. We don't know who no one is. They don't have badges. They don't talk to the people in the office. They don't sign in. They just walk through the building. We need to move those kids out of District Heights Elementary School until the work is done. The Band-Aid is fine, but it's not safe. The chemicals that was released today was harmful. Right now, my head is hurting. My kids are complaining about headaches. Children were sick. People got sick. Mr. Fawcett saw me. I almost fell out. Um, something needs to be done, and it needs to be done now. Uh, what would it take a child to be killed? 40% uh, of our teachers are not there because they're sick. I don't know what's going on in that building, but there's a problem there, and we need to have it fixed now. I don't want my kids to die. I want my kids to have an education, and I want you all to do something about this, because today was the last straw for me. I can't do no more. 
My nerves are shut. I'm sick, and I have to go through this. To have uh, my neck is, and head is hurting. This, whatever was released in this building today, was the last straw to let me know that it's not safe for these kids to be in this building while you all do work in here. Somebody needs to do something for somebody get seriously hurt. And we need to do it now, not yesterday, not today, but we need to do this now before somebody get hurt. Please help us. Help us help those children. Those kids are there to learn, to get an education, not to die, not to get sick. Those people are not there for that. We need help. Please help us over there. The band-aids that you're doing is fine, but do the work that needs to be done and get those kids out of there because you all are killing those babies. Those are our futures for tomorrow. And what you all going to do is sit up here and do nothing and let these babies get sick, let the parents get sick, let the teachers get sick. We need to do something now. We need to help these kids over here. I don't care where we live. We need help, and we need you all to help us now. Mr. Fawcett told me that it was a mistake. Those chemicals were deadly. These kids could have died. I could have died because I volunteer in this building every day. Now, we need some help. You got men walking in here around these children. There's nobody there with ID badges on. We don't know who is who. Nobody signs in the office. Please help us over here in District Heights. I'm finished. Can't do no more. I'm tired. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Thank you so much for your advocacy. We are definitely listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Myra Mace Gomez to speak on High Point Start Time. Hi, my name is Myra Mays Gomez. I'm from High Point High School, and I represent the staff, the teachers, and the kids there. Uh, I want to talk about our start time. Uh, we have, we, our start time used to be 7.45. It went to 8.45, and then you wanted to change it to 9.45. Well, that affects uh, our graduation rate because we have problems with students coming in from the buses. Uh, I want to show you just some of the slips that we get. This is one class, okay? And here's another classroom. This is how many students are late. And our graduation rate will be affected by that. And we are... Uh, a school that is a state designated as priority. So we need the earlier time. It also affects the job problems that our students, uh, we do have a high, one of the highest levels, I think, in the state as far as uh, Hispanics. So uh, there's a lot of students that work. We have partnerships and we need our start time to go back to 745. We do have a lot of bus problems, and that causes problems with uh, the first period. You'll have one teacher with 15 kids that come in late. That disturbs and disrupts the educational part of our classes. Uh, you want our graduation rate to increase? That's going to affect it. So we do need you to consider taking us back to 745 and I think that that would help us uh, uh, to bring up our graduation rate. Uh, this, we have a survey here uh, students have signed. I can give those to you. Uh, we have parent signatures here and the teacher surveys. The teacher surveys, 80%, uh, 82% was against the change and only 18% wanted to start late. Uh, so we have the students being very active on this. We are uh, asking, we are pleading with you to help us bring our graduation rate up to where it should be if you would just change our time. Back to 745. We talked to Congress. Uh, our council lady, and she would like to work with some of you to help us bring our graduation rate back uh, up. 
by one, changing our time back. Please consider that. I would like to thank you for listening to me, and you have a good evening. Thank you. And thank you for your comment. Our next speaker is Jocelyn Ford to talk about CPS as it relates to bus drivers. Good evening, school board members. Good evening. My name is Jocelyn Ford, and I'm here to talk about CPS cases in the school system and how it affects the bus drivers and attendants who are accused. When this happened to a driver or attendant, they're placed on administrative leave pending an investigation. You're, re you're told to report to your job location where you sit and you wait from anywhere from two to eight months waiting to be informed about the investigation. When you acquire, it takes a little bit longer. We're being told it's CPS, then CPS is saying it's security, then security is saying it's ELRO. The problem is when a driver or a bus attendant is exonerated, there's no repercussion against the accuser. These are children, and they're not aware of the seriousness of their action. This is what our children are saying. Now on the bus drive an attendant, and we'll get them kicked off the bus which it caused a trickle-down effect, which make buses being late because we don't have enough drivers to do the route. And it's also, there's no, when you're, when you're accused of being, when you're on CPS, there are no apology when you're, from your accuser once you've been cleared. There's no apology from the school. There's no apology from transportation. Also, drivers and attendants who do extra work are losing money because you're not allowed to do any extra work when you have a CPS charge against you. And I feel that when there's a video providing that you, your accuser is lying, it should not take a month, it should not take months to be cleared. We are ESPs. Is this what we are teaching our children? Can you please help and untie our hands because that's how I feel. And I would like to ask if Mr. David Murray could come to my child's graduation at CMIT because I do have a senior. And thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Our next speaker is Lynetta Stevens-Wright speaking on Tyak Elementary School. Good afternoon, board members. I'm here to discuss my concerns of Tyak Elementary School. The school has poor leadership and needs new leadership. For the first time, the first line principal and third grade reading teachers. Assault on my third grade child. Recently suffered a brain concussion and asthma attack on school ground. It's a very hostile environment and unsafe environment. And they have no school nurse because they claim they have no budget for one. Okay, the budget is poor and able to function properly, but they have high salaries. Tyak Elementary needs to have a change. We need to have it where the schools are more investigated, more you know, thoroughly with the principal to see how she's checking things out, along with um, strengthening the budget. Not many parents touch on the dysfunctionality of the school. Yet and still, we have an MGM here looming, money all over the place. Where it's going, we don't know, but the school has been suffering for a long time with the same principal, and I'm asking you that you all would see to it that some changes occur in that school. Um, my son was very, very ill. We had to take him to Children's Medical Center after some child pushed his head into the ground. He suffered a concussion with not two knots on his head. I have pictures of where he was choked out by this one child, yet I had to raise a concern. Once I raised a concern, now I'm retaliated against because they're not used to, to parents like myself speaking out about what's going on in that school. So I'm just asking that you all would 
do something. I do care. I care not just about my son, but about all of the children. And it is my neighborhood school. I'm not obliged to having my child transfer out to another school. It's his neighborhood school. But there's something not right about the first line principal. It's been going on for years. And it's going to take you all to please, please do a job with your budget. With There are many budget concerns, whereas they're borrowing, begging the parents for school supplies. My child can't go to the bathroom when he has to. He's forced to hold it. I've shared with them that he's asthmatic. I've shared with them that he has bladder control issues. And this one third grade teacher is constantly, constantly taking out her frustrations and retaliation on my child. Thank you very much, school board. Thank you very much, Ms. Stevens-Wright. Our next speaker is Shirley Kirkland speaking on supporting your support system. Good evening, board members and administration. My name is Shirley Kirkland, president of ACE AFME Local 2250. I stand before you today representing the 6,000 members of Local 2250 and the innocent children that we serve. I am in disbelief of the actions of this executive board and administration for your willful neglect to take immediate corrective action to ensure a safe and healthy work and learning environment equally across this school district, not only in the more affluent and geographical areas. Your actions as it applies to major matters of concern are questionable at best. To willfully expose staff and students to toxins that are scientifically proven to cause long-term health issues is willful neglect. Many work, many work locations where staff and students are exposed to unhealthy learning and working environment. What happened to the regular building inspections? To give the appearance of existing concerns being non-existent is deceiving. After a little research, it is a fact that none of these issues are new to the school district. Administration, CEO, Board of Education, you sign off on termination recommendations daily for willful neglect. I ask you, who would be held accountable for the willful neglect and termination in this case for your total disregard for humanity, for the staff and students, but um, for the staff, but most of all, the students that we serve? In the case of District Heights Elementary and guarded bus lot, yet employee children and children can, uh, continue to be exposed to life-threatening pollutants. PGCPS is a great school district. However, the actions of the school board and the administration is questionable. Our children and employees have the right to work in a safe and healthy environment to be able to serve our children. Your willful neglect of properly maintaining and inspecting all work locations for environmental compliance warrants the same swift action that is imposed on employees when labeled as an act of willful neglect, which is termination. So I ask, who would be held accountable for the long-term willful neglect of the facilities housing our children and staff? Lack of compassion of health of human lives is inexcusable and appalling. Why do we allow geographical area to define the quality of care or concern? Yes, I'm speaking for our schools inside the Capitol Beltway. You all need to do some soul searching and to do what is right for our children. Dr. Maxwell, we are still in full support of your budget and are holding you to your word as it refers to the salary increases for this school district, your support system. I see um, they ask for approval for agenda items. Can I finish this last sentence? For agenda items 6.1 through 6.14, but I don't see any mention of um, an amount for wage increases. Should it be included? Thank you, Ms. Kirkland. Our next speaker is Latrice Smith in support of Dr. Maxwell's budget. Good, ev good evening, members of the school board. I am Latrice Smith, Food Satellite Leader and ACE ASME Local 2250 Co-Chair of the Food Service Chapter. I love my job and I'm good at it. We are committed to being the best 
contribution to the Prince George's County Public Schools mission of having outstanding academic achievement for all students. Tonight, I'm speaking to you in my role as a food service chapter co-chair for the ACE AFNI Local 2250. While the challenges I face as a food service satellite leader are daunting, when I consider the big picture concerns for my department, such as short staffing, lack of proper working equipment, and more food programs than resources to manage them, just to name a few. The task can be overwhelming. <coughs> Excuse me. As support staff, our concerns about the work are many. Within the safety of our <coughs> excuse me, union hall at chapter meetings, the employees have concerns about working under the hardest of circumstances. However, undeterred, most of, our, most of us realize that we do this work not only because it provides an income for our families, but we also contribute to the children of our communities. We are part of the village that it takes to raise a child. There are stories I could share with you of employees uh, working off of the clock because the additional time is not authorized and yet the work must get done. We have employees in acting and working out of class positions which even today have not accurately been compensated since the beginning of the school year. Moreover, it's almost the end of the school year. I ask you to recognize the commitment of our employees by holding the CEO accountable to his budget to ensure the monies targeted for employee wages are allocated and the amount proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Our next speaker is Thomas Stewart on the 2008 operating budget. Good evening, school board. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. One of the fabulous things about working and living in Prince George County is that the school board and school administration have proved themselves both willingly and capable of not selling for ordinary e education for our children. I'm both a product of this, of this school system and now an employee. I'm also a proud member of ACME, ASME, Local 2250, and serve as an executive board member for the maintenance chapter. Despite all challenges facing our school system, so large and so diverse, we find ways to make it work. Within our building services department, our employees, with the leadership of Mr. Sam Stefanelli, have made great strides to improve the service that de delivered to many clients. We serve in, in, in the schools, kitchens, office, and school kitchen office of the Prince George County Public School System. Mr. Stefanelli, in recent presentation of our employees, was very up, upbeat and complimented about the department accomplishments. In fact, we heard that you, the Board of Education members, has recognized the increased progress such that awards a total of $10 million to our budget to ensure we had the resource to get our work done in a continuous, timely, and effective manner. I ask that you take that vote of confidence one step further and honor the, pro the project budget of Dr. Maxwell specified that portions of the budget for wages that act, act will show your respect for the workers and employees that make our system capable and probable extraordinary education for our children. Thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Our next speaker is Teresa Dudley, PGCEA president, speaking on District Heights Elementary School. If I could have a moment of personal privilege before I talk about District Heights, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to share with the um, Board of Education and Dr. Maxwell that um, Donna Christie one of our school psychologists was, um, I'm very excited to announce that um, she was nominated by the Prince George's County School Psychologist Association. And this past weekend, it is my honor to report that Donna was selected as the 2017 um, Maryland School Psychologist Association School Psychologist of the Year. So I'm. 
She is a PGCA board member and she has really actively been working very actively in that area and I would be remiss if I did not honor her today. Um, I guess you can start my time now. I'm ready. Um, this has been a great year for us in, in many ways. Um, the budget looks good that we can work with the school system, um, increasing PAR, peer assistance and review, looking forward to um, compensation enhancements, um, restorative practices, um, uh, and including PGCEA in the medical review and other labor in the medical review plans for the year. So that's been, I mean, that was a really good experience and we all worked really hard and came up with some good recommendations, which you'll see later on. Um, I'm also pleased about the Teacher Academy being in the budget and I left this paper over here. It's my district heights testimony, I'm sorry. Um, on um, April the 5th, I submitted a letter on behalf of the teachers at District Heights to Dr. Maxwell because according to the negotiated agreement um, as a president of PGCEA, um, the teachers are encouraged to bring to the attention of the principal conditions which they consider may be unsafe for students, teachers, for review and as appropriate for referral to the appropriate school authority. Therefore, if a te the teacher is still concerned, the teacher may request further review by the regional assistant chief executive officer. If in a specific situation, the president of PGCEA believes further consideration is appropriate, the president may request a review by the chief executive officer of the school system, which I did. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, and I'm not gonna read the whole letter to you, I will leave it for, for a testimony. But I did submit a request to Dr. Maxwell asking that the students and staff at um, District Heights be moved and that they be relocated due to the air quality concerns. Um, I was a little remiss at the last board meeting when I heard some of the testimony um, concerning the school and um, how the teachers were doing in that building and when you have staff walking around with two inhalers, one in each hand, and staff members reporting to me that they've used up all of their leave, that's a problem, Mr. Alexander Wallace. And to, to um, not, characterize- by, not, not direct names, Mr. Okay, Lee, well, I'm, I, I, I was very, I, he took great liberty at the last meeting in speaking on behalf of the principal of the school and saying that she was not concerned about the environment that was there at the school. So that's why I'm, I directed that at him because she, she told me she was sick. She told me she was sick. The staff is sick. People are going home sick. And the, the unusual fumes, I, as the president of PGCA, our negotiated agreement allows me to bring that before the CEO. And I felt as though it was ignored. And we were told as labor, all four of the labor unions asked for this, for the children and the staff to be moved during all of this because you're making Herculean efforts to fix this problem while children and the staff are sitting in the middle of it. And that's a problem. So we were, again, as I asked in my original letter, I'm gonna ask again to please move them so that, these, so that the children and the staff can have some relief. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adeline Wilcox speaking on, uh, on policy committee on public comment. I'm a home, homeowner in Beltsville. I am here to express resistance to the proposed restrictions on the number and subject of public comments to the Board of Education. A few days ago, I received a solicitation from the American Civil Liberties Union in the mail. The information the ACLU sent me about the Trump administration was supposed to motivate me. Reading it, I realized here in Prince George's County, the Democratic Party poses a greater threat to our civil liberties, particularly free speech. Please continue to allow public comment without change to current policy. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes uh, our public comments. Uh, as always, we thank you for 
uh, the great contributions you've uh, made. And uh, yeah, you want to uh, uh, yeah. honor someone who's in the audience? Yep, I want to uh, give a point of uh, personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank um, a couple of speakers, but I definitely want to just to point out Ms. Wright uh, for her advocacy um, coming here today while she's sick, again, to advocate um, on behalf of the children at District Heights Elementary School. I think that the message is very clear. Uh, so I if am you very wanna, disappointed if you want, if you want, that we you are not doing speak, anything about the issue. You cannot speak I think that, to that we need issue, to remove those students young man, from District Heights Elementary School. Young man, it is you cannot absolutely speak ridiculous. Issue, that is my Thank place. you, Ms. Wright. That is Thank my you all for coming down and speaking Thank out you. on this. If they won't do anything about it, I will. Thank you. This is absolutely ridiculous. Thank you. Absolutely ridiculous we'll move on to our next agenda item. not even show up. Well, and now you, you are out of order, young man. Give it, give it. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to our consent agenda, and I will yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for uh, uh, an introduction of items 5.1 and 5.2 under the consent agenda. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks. Members of the board, items 5.1 and 5.2 require board approval of proclamations commemorating National Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month and National School Nurses Day on May 10, 2017. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, may I please have a motion uh, to uh, approve items 5.1 and 5.2 under the consent agenda? So moved. May I have a second? It's been moved and seconded to approve items 5.1 and 5.2 under the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Thank you. That motion carries. I'll now yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for an introduction of items 6.1 through 6.14 under the budget consent agenda. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks. Members of the board, items 6.1 to 6.14 require board approval of the following items. A multi-year contract for E-rate internet access, fiscal year 2017 approval operating uh, budget, an increase in restricted FTEs, final acceptance and payment for work at Edward M. Felagy Elementary School, an award for a construction contract for work at Ridgecrest Elementary School, an award of a construction contract for uh, system window replacement at various schools, an award of a, contract, a construction contract for elevator and conveyance system replacements at various schools, a change order for requested work at the Crossland bus lot, Approval of a grant bill for the Culinary Arts Academy at Crossland High School and approval of the May 2017 expenditure requirements. Thank you, colleagues. May I please have a motion to approve items 6.1 through 6.14 under the budget consent agenda? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say, uh, we want to have some questions. Yes, Ms. Ahmed. Um, so for items 6.05 through 6.07, that, those are the ones that uh, talk about the Annapolis Road Academy, Beltsville Academy, and Glenridge Elementary School elevator and lift replacement um, to keep up with the ed specs. I'm just wondering what is being done to update other schools that don't have lifts or elevators to get to the second floor? Because I know that there are some schools in my district like Heather Hills, Kenilworth, and Tulip Grove that don't have them, and I've heard stories of grandparents coming on wheelchairs and students coming in crutches and walkers that can't access the second floor with ease um, and I can only assume that th th those are cases that are happening around the county um, and I know it's it's said in, in our ed specs that the entire facility should be accessible to students staff and visitors so I'm just wondering these these are a couple projects that are on there which is great but what's being done for other projects in other schools uh, Ms. Ahmed, we'll get more information about the particular schools that you have. Uh, we need to look into some of that as well, though. Okay. Okay. And then um, one so other. So, could you list the schools again? Because that was, those will be sure. follow up items. These are just a couple that I know of. I don't know if there are other in my district um, or in other districts, but the ones I know of are Heather Hills, Tulip Grove, and Kenilworth. And we'll look at those specifically so we'll those and we'll check for others as well. Yeah. Right. I think it'd be important to check for others um, because it, it, I, you know, those are just what I know. Um, the other thing is the items that come before budget consent, could they, is it possible for them to be explained in detail to board members at their FAB committee meeting 
before putting it on here. I just think the purpose of a consent agenda is to kind of package things together to move forward so uh, with minimal discussion, but I think that there are some things, especially when it relates to contracts, that might benefit from, from delving in, um, in in a different setting. Uh, that's also public, but just delving into that a little bit more in case there are questions or discussion items. Is it possible? I don't know. So we're certainly happy to answer questions that board members have, whether that's at a committee meeting or when you get the packet that we send you to, you know, call. We'll set up a time to, you know, get people in front of you that can answer the right questions, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the, the pleasure is. But consent agenda items, I think, are just things that are routinely moving forward at a particular time, and there's usually a history to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, no other questions, so I'll put the vote before you. All those in favor uh, of budget consent agenda uh, 6.1 through 6.14, uh, please signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Thank you. That motion carries. Uh, I'll now yield the floor to Dr. Maxwell for uh, an introduction of items 9.1 through 9.10 under new business first reading. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks, members of the board. As you know, items 9.1 to 9.10 are, are for board approval as first readers and require no discussion. There are a series of contract awards and uh, charter renewals. Thank you, colleagues. I have a motion to accept items 9.1 through 9.10 under new business first reader. May I have a second? Thank you. Uh, these are just first readers. No. Uh, Required, but I will uh, ask for questions. Mr. Burroughs, you got? Yeah, so can I uh, pull 9.4 out uh, to vote on separately and to discuss separately? You want to? I'd like to second that. Uh, oh, yeah, would you, we don't mind whoever made the motion. We'll pull 9.4 to discuss separately. Mr. Valentine. I was going to echo my uh, colleagues. But also add 9.03 as well. But I wonder, since we've already made a motion, can we do that? If not, we could take a separate motion to allow myself and Mr. Burroughs' motion to move forward, 9.3 and 9.4. Without objection, I will remove those, and we will vote on the rest and come back to them. See no objection. Are you objecting to that, Ms. Ahmed? No, I just had a question on the uh, rest of the items on a couple of. OK, well, so, so we're remove we're Putting aside 9.3 and 9.4, you have a question about one of the other ones. Yeah, in terms of the textbook adoptions, I see that committees were formed for each of these actions. Um, are there any committee minutes that I can go through to understand the basis of conversation that led to these recommendations? We can provide the notes that we have. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, we will put before you uh, to approve items 9.1 and 9.2 and 9.5 through 9.10 as new business first readers. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Thank you. We'll go back to item 9.3. Uh, let's get, you want to get a motion on the floor to approve it and then have some discussion. So move. Second. Been moved and second to approve 9.3. Discussion. Thank you. Uh, I just had a question around the uh, performance of the school and some of the proposed amendments or uh, waivers that the system, I wanted someone from the system to be able to answer these questions. I see my colleague in the back. Uh, how are you doing? Are you, can, you, can you answer a question for me? Uh, no, just the application in general. I'm guessing that they have a, the whole team at second reader, so they might be limited at this point. Yeah, but I, I, I'm particularly curious about the administration's responses to their report. So, for example, there's a report that was submitted um, in this application. In my understanding, this application was submitted by the school or by the system? This application is submitted by the school. I mean, I'm, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I beg your pardon. The renewal re application report, was that done by us or by them? It's done by the district. Okay, the and so the report is done by the district, and it is a cumulative of the annual site visits, 
along with the renewal application requesting approval. So, so will you have um, not met, approaching met and exceeding the green and the yellow, these are determinations that we've made in the system, not them reporting back to us on what they've determined what they are. Right. Okay. Uh, that was my question, particularly because I saw the report and my assumption was that they submitted it to us and that I just wanted to ensure that you were in agreement with it, but since you generated it, I'm sure you are. Yes. Um, and then the second question, um, did you want to comment particularly on, on some of the waivers they asked for and um, why we determined we did not want to approve the waiver, particularly around professional development and uh, I believe they also asked for a waiver uh, around the lottery. The request for the professional development was to exempt them from the district's uh, PD for their school leaders and sometimes their teachers. Uh, after speaking with the executive staff, we felt like it was best to deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis rather than to in totality exempting them from it. But we've worked over the years in addressing their uh, requests for exemptions right. on specific situations. And okay. I have here the representative from Imagine's uh, regional office who can speak more about why they felt the need to do that. Okay, I'd be curious to hear from them if they Hello, good evening, board. I'm Dr. Yeah. McMichael, Regional Director for Imagine Schools in Maryland. So the reason for the waiver is in particular about how um, our school leaders um, are continuously out of the building and have to serve the dual role of not only meeting the compliances of the county, but also meeting the compliances of Imagine Schools as we have um, our, expe our expectations for the school leaders as well. And we just want to get a balance where they're actually not only um, getting the professional development that is needed from the district, but also get, getting the same leverage of professional development at a high level for Imagine Schools with the same respect to both. And the, and the waiver for the lottery addition, you all requested a waiver from the, from the lottery being conducted by the county as opposed to yourself? So as far as in the lottery situation at one of our other schools, what we have done is done a piloted model. Um, and we felt the need or we feel that based on the success of the model um, at another school location where we are taking on a piece of that lottery or percentage based on the military base, that we feel that we have the systems in place to conduct our own lottery system working alongside Prince George's County. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Burroughs, do you have a question? I, I do have a quick question. Uh, is there, do you expect a different outcome from our lottery versus yours? Probably, it will probably be a different one. We probably be, will be able to um, manage it a little bit more um, than when we have it through the system. Um, as you know, um, when, when parents apply for a lottery, they apply to various schools. Um, so when we were given the list, you know, the, there may be one parent that, or parents that select a certain school, but then they're on other lists. So I think it would just assist with the streamlining of those parents that are truly invested in applying for their students, or what we call scholars, um, to be into our program. Our charter program. So I guess what, what I'm getting at, um, uh, all students will still have access. You're, you're not absolutely. You're, you're not absolutely. Okay, and and I knew that would be the case, and that's why I actually I buzzed in to speak in favor of this renewal. And I thank you, Mr. Valentine, for raising that point because all kids deserve access to high quality schools, and Imagine Leland is definitely a high quality school. Um, and I, I did want to recognize. Uh, Mr. Sean Toller, who's here, who does a phenomenal job, the principals here, and some of the other team members. I want to thank you for the work that you do every day um, at Imagine Leland. Last time I checked, and I haven't checked in a while, to be honest, it was the highest performing Imagine uh, in, in the district. Yes, still it is. is. And, still and, and I expect nothing less from that extraordinary team. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, we'll have plenty of time. We'll actually vote on that more formally at second reader, and we can you can say a lot more. Uh, 
Is that it? I see no further questions. I will put the vote before you to put item 9.3 on as first reader. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Thank you. That motion carries. 9.4. I've been motion on the floor to approve 9.4 as first reader. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Mr. Burrell. Uh, can I have someone from the administration, and I know we have representatives from College Park here, um, to, to, talk, to talk about, okay, <laughs> thank you, back again so soon. As they are approaching the bench, I'd like to say oh. I'm very proud of all 10 of our charter schools. They are doing well. We all <laughs> got to improve everywhere. So, uh, <laughs> but if you can hold my time, because he was walking up. So, uh, not you, the, the clock went. Yeah, as 10 you were, seconds, Mary, go ahead. Oh. Right, so. You, yeah. you all, you all uh, 10 seconds. Can you talk about some of the successes of College Park Academy and some of the exciting new things that are happening there? Uh, uh, first of all, yes, we can. And I am Mike Potterella. I'm the Vice President and General Counsel of the University of Maryland, and I'm a board member at College Park Academy. A privilege to be with you here uh, with you all. Uh, I am going to invite up uh, our interim principal and our executive director to, who have the detailed knowledge of those successes. Uh, so that they can share those efficiently during your time. Peter, you're making me look bad. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Bernadette Ortiz Brewster. I'm the uh, executive director, and this is our wonderful principal, or founding principal, I was too, and this is our wonderful principal, Mr. Baker. And I would like to have Mr. as Many of you already know, we have scored exceptionally high on state assessments uh, consistently for four years with our blended learning model. And I would like Mr. Baker to discuss some of our scores in detail. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Baker. I'm the interim principal um, at College Park Academy and I could talk a little bit about um, some of our successes over the past year, especially um, in relation with uh, uh, park scores as well as the, our most um, recent map R score. So, um, in, in pretty much all of the grade levels that we um, gave our uh, park test to as compared to the rest of Prince George's County and then also some of our neighboring counties like Howard County and Montgomery County as well, we met or exceeded standards. Um, I'll give just some examples. In sixth grade English, 50% um, of our students met or exceeded standards as compared to um, our Prince George's County peers which scored 26.2%. Um, in seventh grade for Park English, 44.4% uh, of our students met or exceeded standards as compared to our uh, Prince George's County peers where 32.3% met or exceeded. Um, on eighth grade Park English, 38.3% of our students met or exceeded standards as compared to our Prince George's County peers where 26.8% uh, met or exceeded. Um, in sixth grade Mathematics, 28.6% uh, of our students met or exceeded expectations compared to our Prince George's County peers were 17.1%. Um, in seventh grade mathematics, 36.5% of our students met or exceeded expectations um, as compared to our Prince George's County peers where less than 5% achieved that. And then our eighth grade park um, math scores, 27.1% of our students uh, met or exceeded standards uh, as compared to our uh, Prince George's County peers where 16.8% of those students met or exceeded expectations. As you know too, we've, um, we have high school now at our school, right. um, and so also we met, um, we exceeded expectations too um, for our Park Algebra 1 scores. 25.7% of our students met or exceeded standards as compared to our um, Prince George's County peers where 16.6% of those students um, met or exceeded expectations. With both, uh, in more recent data, um, our fall and winter um, administrations of the MAP R testing, which is a more up-to-date um, testing method as compared to like SRI before. Uh, we've also exceeded expectations um, and also are performed um, our Prince George's County peers. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. And I appreciate the work that you're doing there. I had an opportunity to tour the school um, and, and I loved it. Uh, and you have a new building coming, is that right? We do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, and you know, they can maybe speak a little bit more intelligently uh, to me about this, but um, than me about this, but um, we'll be moving actually pretty much right around the corner from where we are on River Tech Court. Um, so we're currently um, on Adelphi Road and we'll be moving on to the University of Maryland property, um, which is off of River Tech Court. Um, a less busy street, which we're excited about for our kids when they're leaving school, um, but we're very excited about this new building. 
Um, we are very excited about it, obviously, as board members and at the university also, and, and just so that everybody knows, I think it was roughly, and I have a, some fellow board members here with me, about uh, uh, beginning of the school year, end of the summer, that we finally uh, committed to this building, which did not leave a lot of time for construction. And luckily, we have a great relationship with St. John Properties, and they have just been kicking you-know-what to get this done and get us get us open for the beginning of the school year. And we really appreciate and I want to thank the support we've had uh, from the University System of Maryland, which had to give some approvals for the university to be able to get involved in this deal. And uh, we're looking forward to the opportunities it provides for our students and their families. Um, I have been working with actually a team from Prince George's County, St. John's Properties, as well as the University of Maryland. So it's been truly a collaborative effort in building this building. Um, we have a 50,000 square foot facility. We have two um, state-of-the-art independent learning centers, which is where our students do their virtual work. And then we have typical classrooms, but they'll be state-of-the-art as well. So we're very excited about this. Um, the building is now 80% complete. I was there this morning. We have drywall, so we can actually see the size of the building, the uh, classrooms. Uh, we are now working with vendors for furniture. We want to also build in a component for health and wellness. So we have movable furniture and trying to initiate more exercise in the classrooms. So this is truly gonna be a showcase facility. The location of the facility is incredible as well because it allow our students to go to internships around the university campus and to also attend uh, dual enrollment classes at the university. So we're very excited about this facility and you'll have to come out and see it. I would love to. Uh, and so, I, so you mentioned that your students are outperforming the district and you have the state-of-the-art facility showcase facility that you must be very excited about and I want to vote for your contract today great thank you very much <laughs> uh, but for me there's one aspect that I have deep concern about and that is the 35 percent in catchment area I'm under the fundamental belief that all kids in Prince George's deserve access to high quality opportunities like the ones that, you're, that you've just described. And they should have access at an equal opportunity level as everyone else. Students don't determine what zip code they live in. They don't determine if their parent works at the University of Maryland. And so that, that, that is something that I truly am struggling with. Can you talk briefly about someone from the university, talk briefly about the university's uh, intentions and goals related to that that catchment area. Sure. Um, and I also want to uh, thank uh, Member Burroughs. We had a conversation ahead of time, so we had a chance to have a private conversation about this, so I, I appreciated that heads up, and I appreciate your concerns. Um, the university has been quite open about the fact that uh, in opening this charter school, that one of its primary goals was to try to improve services to our local community. And so if you look at the local charter law, and I'm just reading from the summary that staff wrote about this, um, you know, the charter law allows guaranteed placement through a lottery to students who live within the geographic attendance area for up to 35%. So that's, a, that's what the law allows. And I think we can read that to imply pretty strongly that having a preference for the local area around a school is actually a good factor, that serving the local community is something that's valued and recognized in the law. And so we're simply seeking to exercise that ability. Now, the, 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 the catch, if you will, no pun intended, is that in order to qualify, uh, you need to have uh, a median income in the area that is equal to or less than the median income of the county, and we meet that standard. And, and that's what's indicated in the board action. So we're simply looking to take advantage of what the law allows, serve the community, but by doing so, based on the statistics, I think we, in essence, are serving a, you know, a, 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 we're mirroring the county <coughs> demographics, if you will. That's what the statistics show, and, and that's only for 35%. For 65%, we're still wide open. Yeah, I, I understand that. And uh, if I were a university, I would understand the desire to uh, take care of the area where my employees live and where I'm based. That makes perfect sense. I think from a school board's perspective, it's my job to make sure that every kid in this school district, whether they live in Temple Hills, where there's no university, or Hillcrest Heights, or Forest Heights, have equal access um, to those services. And this currently does not 
uh, allow that. And when you talk about you, you outperforming the district and the new facility, my kids in Temple Hills deserve the same opportunity as a student in College Park or near College Park. Um, and so, the, the colleagues, we talk about equity a lot. And for me, this is a matter of equity. And like I said, we've talked ahead of this. I think, you know, we are on the same, you understand where I'm coming from, I understand mm -hmm. where you're coming from. Yeah. I want to thank the university, I want to thank you for, for being willing to, to have that conversation. Uh, but I think it's something, as colleagues, we need to figure out because, um, like I said, my, my, my kids in Temple Hills and Hillcrest Heights and Forest Heights will never have an attachment area uh, if, it's, if we're only doing them for universities that are based there because we don't have that. Um, and your, I, I get your position, uh, but, but mine is um, it's our job to ensure that every student have, has equal access, similar to science and tech. If you live in College Park, if you live in Central County, or if you live in Southern part of the county, you have access to a science tech program no matter where you live at an equal rate. And that's what I would be interested in having that dialogue. And until we have that, and I know you're on, on board from what I understand to, to expand in that, but until we do that, um, I, I don't want to exclude anybody or give preference to anybody until everybody has access. And so uh, the executive director, if you can talk a little bit about, about that. Well, yeah, the, the only comment I would make, um, and I respect all your goals. As I mentioned, um, my dad taught in Detroit his whole career. So trust me, I get equity, and, and I get trying to help as many kids as you can. Um, you made a comment about want the university wanting to serve its employees and its families. And I think if you look at the actual factors, that's not the case in our neighborhood. I'm a rare exception of somebody who works at the university and actually lives in Prince George's County. And I think one of the things we want to do is we want to serve those existing community members who meet the demographics of the state law, who, without regard to whether those families live or have some re existing relationship with the university, it's simply a matter of geography. And, and geography um, has a lot to do with equity as well. <laughs> If you live in the northern part of the county, you will receive preference based on zip code. And that is contrary to what I believe we as a board should be instituting. And so I want to vote for this today. I would like to take the, the 35. I would like, you know, granted, I think your position is you want to keep it in. Uh, my position is it needs to come out, so I recognize that. But uh, I do want to work with you uh, moving forward to figure out how do we provide every kid with access to this high quality state of the art facility that's outperforming the county. Well, and one of the things we have talked about um, as a board is how do we leverage or scale the success that we're starting to have at CPA. And my only caution, we talked about this privately, is you have to crawl before you walk and you have to walk before you run. And we are still in the process of early stage ramp up, we're still scaling up. We have to add an 11th grade next year and then a 12th grade and we're going into a new building right now. But once we get to what I would consider to be more of a steady state, and right. once we've proved out this hybrid learning model some more with the great support we're getting from our College of Education, um, I, I think there's a lot we can talk about and we look forward to those conversations. Yeah, so why not let all kids have access until you get to that point? Well. That's just, that's not the way we look at the issue. I mean, the, the, the university's interest in College Park Academy from the beginning has been centered around that area where, where we exist in a different way of engaging with our community than preceded Dr. Lowe's administration. So we view that as a positive. We don't view it as we're doing it on behalf of the university. We look at it as the university doing a service to our immediately surrounding community and, and not at all to be uh, uh, disadvantaging anyone in the county. I mean, there are a limited number of spaces in the school, and so by definition, there has to be some process where it's determined who comes, and there's, you know, not everybody can go to that school. It's a great problem to have. 
uh, we're glad we're having this success, and we'd like to scale and leverage it as much as we can, as much as resources allow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have Ahmed Eubanks, Hernandez, Valentine, and Williams. Before I go on, I'll remind colleagues that today's vote is to vote on first reader to put it on the agenda for us to vote and or amend and or vote up and down the contract at second reader. We're not voting on College Park Academy's future today. We're voting to put it on the agenda to vote on College Park's future <laughs> at the next board meeting. Uh, and so as we, have, uh, obviously for first reader, we tend not to, not to discuss, but always we not want to leave that open, but I'll leave that to, to folks to just uh, make sure that that's the context of the uh, discussion that we're having today. Uh, so I'll go to Ms. Ahmed. Uh, Mr. Baker, Ms. Ortiz. Brewster, it's nice to see you all again. Thank you very much for giving me and a, a number of our board members a tour of your facility. I think it's amazing. I think the work that you do is amazing. Um, I had a, a quick question and then uh, some concerns. Uh, do you all know what percentage of the students that are currently at CPA belong to the catchments area defined in the proposal? Thank you. <laughs> so for right now for the current school year, out of the 345, there's 26 students who currently live in the catchment area at the sixth grade level. Something else. I am. Hey, okay. Just, just a second. I'm sorry. Just, I'm sorry. Sure. I think it runs by grade level. I think right. what she's looking at, she yeah, just told you I sixth apologize. grade. So it's so a little different the, for each grade level. Exactly. So out of the total enrolled students in the who are in the proposed catchment area right now, it's a total of 77 out of 536, which is 14.4%. And so I have the information. So um, there's nine students who were from Berwyn Heights Elementary School. 22 from Cherokee Lane, 15 from Hollywood Elementary, five from Paint Branch, eight from Riverdale, 18 from University Park. Okay. Um, May I add one more thing? Sure. Um, so from, I guess from previous conversations years past, there was a, I guess the catchment area was closer to just College Park. We have expanded the proposal um, significantly to reach out to other areas, not just College Park. Okay. Um, I think we've had some conversations about this before, about my uneasiness with the catchments area. Um, I'm very uneasy with the idea of a public charter with the, with the catchments area. and. I haven't seen anything like this proposal before. Um, I'm not sure that it'll address the overcrowding in the way that's intended, um, because naturally charters don't provide transportation, so there's this perception of access without true access almost. And that's just my, you know, that's my take on it. But it seems to me, based upon the numbers, if we have 14% now that are currently in the catchments area, and the request is for 35%, that could be about 100 kids or so. Um, that could be, this, this is just my rough, writing it out um, and so when we're talking about relieving overcrowding at a, you know a number of those schools and, and that number is a hundred I don't know if that um, it, you know makes makes the case for the overcrowding as as much as I'd probably like to see it but I just think you know I'm I'm a triple alum I'm I went to University of Maryland College Park I was I've been around the College Park community for a long time um, I served I worked um, as a presenter in a program that went around to do literacy workshops in over a dozen schools around College Park. And so I see what our students face and I understand that community, but at the same time, I understand Mr. Burroughs' point of we're here to represent the needs of all of our students and provide them with the opportunity to get the amazing type of education that you provide. And so it's a real big struggle and a push and pull in my head on this proposal because I know how where it was at and I know how far it's come and I still don't know if I can be on board 
and that's just a really difficult thing for me. But those are just a couple of my thoughts. Ms. Ahmed, can I clarify one thing you said? Sure. So we currently have a charter school right now that has a catchment area. And that's Imagine Andrews, which is on the military base. Mm -hmm. And under state law, they're allowed a 65% set aside for military students. So it's a pretty big set aside. Um, and so, so Imagine Andrews right now has 65% of the students are students who are on base, and 35% of the students are 35% are, of the seats are reserved for students who are who don't live on base. Okay. Um, and that's something that is provided for in state law, just as this allows um, charter schools to have a set aside for 35% under state law. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. I'll just say quickly again, I, I kind of made a point about the fact that I'm, I look forward to a significantly more robust discussion about this uh, when it comes uh, before us on second reader. And uh, uh, just because we've had so much discussion about it, a hint the fact that um, our job as a board is to provide equitable uh, learning opportunities for students across our district. Equitable doesn't always mean identical. Uh, the fact is, it is true that we have three science and tech programs, but no one from District 8 can go to Roosevelt. A ain't going to happen. We have dozens of career academies. Those are all geographically determined. Which career academy you can go to determines where you live. We have dozens of specialty programs that are geographically limited. We have 204 schools, and about 200 of them have catchment areas, right? And so the question is, and it's not, it's got nothing to do with College Park Academy, it's got to do with this board. Are we providing equitable learning opportunities across this district? And our failure to do so has more to do with, with us than not to do, to do, it's not College Park's responsibility to provide equitable learning opportunities throughout the district. It's our opportunity. Now I will say I've been, I've been a strong advocate for expanding the model. I, we have very creative ways in which we've talked about doing that. It doesn't necessarily mean replicating the model exactly as it is, but it could mean putting elements of College Park Academy's model into existing middle schools, finding ways to, to really do that, and we've had some great conversations about that so that we provide that equitable opportunity. And so when, when we really talk about this more at the next meeting, I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that. Um, and uh, I'll stop there. Uh, and well, I don't know, but I will ask you to just speak briefly about all of the different discussions that we've had about the different uh, ideas around how we might expand some of the learning that we're, that we're getting from College Park and some of the innovation that we're getting from College Park to give that learning and innovation to students throughout the county. So one of the things that we started last summer was opening up our summer program uh, which is 100% virtual. So that's the beauty of this program, is that any student in Prince George's County can take one of our classes mm -hmm. virtually, starting this past summer. So that's one of the opportunities that we're very excited about, and we had students do that. And so we, and we have actually advertised on the Prince George's County summer website as well. So that's one way that children can get a taste of what it's like to take a class at CPA. We've discussed professional development. We have an ongoing conversation now with the College of Education. But we also recognize that we have some work to do internally. So we are discussing that internally to train our teachers to become trainers. And so how do we expand that into Prince George's County public school system? There are many ideas that we have. Another being, can we train principals in this model so that they can make the decision whether they should have this or a component of it in their school, which can be easily implemented with just some consultation. So we have plenty of those conversations going on now. I understand the hesitance in committing to some of these things because we realize, and I as the founding principal, realize how difficult this model is to implement if not done properly. So we just want to make sure that we have everything or our ducks in a row before we start spreading this model. But there are many, many ways that we can start this conversation um, within the district that, with our partners. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Max, I kind of saw you leaning in to, no, you good? Okay. All right, thank you. Ms. Hernandez. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Um, just a few uh, clarifying questions, or I guess questions that I think would help our fellow board members um, make this decision when it comes to second reader. Um, can you speak to, uh, if you have this information, if not, I greatly appreciate it if you could provide it, the demographics, or I guess the geographics, of who is applying uh, to um, College Park Academy? So one, one thing that we can do um, is we can go back and we can see who is applying um, through the lottery. That's something that we can get um, for the next board meeting. I will um, talk a little bit about our current demographics to help you get an understanding um, of that. 5% um, of our students are students um, that have uh, medical disabilities, so they'd be under a 504 plan. Uh, we have 6% of our students that um, uh, have IEPs um, in special education. 36% of our students um, are on free and reduced lunch. 5% um, of our students um, are of Asian descent, 14.5% Latino, 10% white, 65% African American, and then 5.5% um, two or more races. Uh, but we will get the information about our lottery and who's applying geographically to our lottery. Thank you. Um, and can you or can someone speak to, I guess, the uh, investment or the type of investment that the University of Maryland has made to, these school, to this school? Um, I think the biggest investment, those of us who are both administrators and on the board are making is sweat equity. Sure. <laughs> so I leave it to others to value the, the value of that. Some days people think it's not very much and other days hopefully they think it's worth something. Um, we, we have, um, uh, I, I think, really used our credit to help get this new facility built uh, and to put the school in a position of being able to to occupy it with the support from the University System of Maryland. And we are foregoing some financial upsides that would otherwise have accrued to the university um, in a similar real estate transaction because of our interest in seeing this uh, school succeed. Um, I think the, one other point saying? I would make, what which- What did he say? <laughs> if, how, if we so were a landlord, money? if so, we were right. a landlord for some unrelated party, you know, we have an interest in this real estate. You could have got a lot more money. money. You could have got mm -hmm. a lot more value for we, the land. Is that we, we, this could be a real estate deal. Right. Okay, and and we've looked away from that side of it. So I think they're saying they've invested tens of millions of dollars yes. in the actual building of the school, but they've also prevented themselves from making tens of millions of dollars by selling it to someone else or having it developed in a different way. So they have a substantial financial investment in the school. Sometimes lawyers need their lawyers and agents too. <laughs> I'm also reminded by my, my, my counsel friend to, to make sure to give note to the fact that our president, Wallace Lowe, is the chairman of the CPA board and the dean of our College of Education, Donna Weisman, is also a board member. So the sweat equity is at the highest levels of the university is supporting this operation. The other thing I would mention, I think it's to the spirit of your question, um, you know, we don't come to this activity um, as some independent body. We're another public educational body that our, our one and only mission is to benefit the students and families that we serve. And so the money that we get from you as a county is all going into education. Thank We're all volunteer board members. We have no financial interest. So when we fill out our conflict of interest form, Shauna, yes, we fill those out for you. <laughs> we say we have no finan personal financial stake in this. Thank you. And, and just one more point, and I, I'm looking forward to when this comes up on second reader. Um, my schools, and I know the overcrowding came up, are heavily overcrowded. This isn't the solution to our overcrowding issues in the northern part of the county, or northwestern part of the county anything would help. We are bursting at the seams. Um, so while I can understand that this is probably not going to alleviate uh, what overcrowding issues we have, I know I can speak to Hyattsville Middle um, and, and to some part Buck Lodge, uh, but certainly appreciate what the catchment area affords the students in the northwestern part of the county. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you for all the information that, um, and it's nine o'clock. 
Um, thank you for all the information that you provided, and I appreciate the tour. Just seeing it firsthand was very helpful to um, understand the success that you're having over there and to hear the numbers today compared to our general population, it, it um, opens my eyes to the possibilities. Um, and I look forward to having a conversation about the other opportunities where we can share some of your success. Um, the one thing that I'm really interested in is if you can talk about the criteria. You mentioned that the 35% that you're asking for in your catchment area um, there were some criteria to the uh, people that you're interested in accepting into your school system. You mentioned demographics, economic um, hardships, and things like that. Can you explain that a little further? What would be the requirement? Um, I'm going to respond to that question. Okay. So um, the charter school law was amended a couple of years ago. And the, the law basically says that a public charter school may pro propose a geographic attendance area with a median income that is equal to or less than the median income of the county for the public charter school. So in this case, uh, the, the household median income uh, for based on our 2011-2015 information was 74260 So that was the median income in the county. And the median income in the catchment area is 59000 So it's less than. So you're saying that they could not select an area that included households that made over that 50 some odd percent. So like, we're not saying that you're looking at, let's say, uh, a gated part of Woodmore. You're looking at areas where there are um, people living below a certain income level in the county. Absolutely. And that's required by law. Okay. So this 35% or this geographical area that you're talking about, it is specifically trying to catch students that are of a certain income bracket or certain um, academic achievement or something like that in that case. Well, I, here's the way I would say it, subject to Shauna correcting me. The, the law allows us to serve up to 35% with our uh, of our of our space for our local geographic area but it also requires that in doing so that that area must have a median income that is at the at or below those thresholds that Shauna recited to you like if they had just picked a, an, an area that only included let's say University Park they probably wouldn't be able to meet the conditions that the law set aside so they've substantially expanded the geographic boundaries to include a larger section of people so that they can meet the exactly. So that just, um, you know, I've had this conversation about boundaries in my district. And I understand the need to um, try to reach those people that are close by, you know, and, and if you're, if the law requires you to be below a certain level, income level, and your initial catchment area did not allow you to meet, you know, where you were trying to go with this 35, 20, whatever the percentage was, so you enlarged it. So you're able to catch a larger group of people that meet that criteria that's closer to your school that you're, where you're located. So what I'm saying is you have enlarged the area to catch more people that meet that criteria, serving um, the community that can come to your, your school easier. The 65% that is open to the um, other parts of Prince George's County, how would they be transported to your school? Are we talking personal transportation? Do you, re do you provide buses with your, um, in your charter school? How do, how are other people, let's say in the southern part of the county, um, getting to your location in College Park? So currently we have, we have a large yellow bus that comes every morning from the south side. Um, so our parents are paying private charter buses for these students to come to the school. Um, That's at, true of all of our charters. None of them yeah. provide transportation. Yeah. So we have, we have several students coming from that area. However, the parents are paying. Just like in any other area where parents want transportation, we do not pay for transportation. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Murray. 
I just wanted to ask, um, so it wasn't in really included in the documents, but what does that actual geographic area consist of? I mean, I assume it uh, is a lot of College Park, but what are the it's other the area areas that are drawn into that catchment area? I can forward you a map. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, can and, you, and I think I'm other board members might want that yeah, as well. It's going to be on when, when, when all of the documents for second reader get uploaded, that, that map will be on there as well. But we'll make, let's make sure that all the board members get it even before that. <coughs> That's all you had, sir? You all set? Okay. Um, so my, uh, my, my colleague, Lupe Grady, is uh, home with strep throat and, uh, and listening uh, intently to this um, and sent me a note. So I'm going to ask her a question, she, which is similar to, to what uh, uh, Ms. Williams asked, given those transportation issues, uh, how many students from the South are applying to the school? Uh, I, I don't have it with me right now, but I can definitely provide okay. that. All right. And one of the, I think one of the things we would hope with our new location is we have, we're going to have much closer proximity to the metro, to the College Park metro. Right. So that should help everyone. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so that, that'll help. Um, so that was me. Round to Mr. Burroughs. I just wanted to address um, some of the things that I heard. First, uh, yes, we do have academies all throughout the county, but uh, if you live in the northern part of the county, you generally have access to a lot of those academies. We, we often replicate the academies north, central, south, so that if I'm a, a student in the Temple Hills area, but I want to go to the culinary program at Oxon Hill, there's a process for that. Um, and then also with the Imagine uh, at Andrews, uh, there are other Imagine schools throughout the county that one could go to, which makes that very different than um, this case. Uh, and I guess the, the last thing that I would raise is really a question. Um, is the 35% geographic and catchment area uh, non-negotiable on uh, from your perspective well, I, I would say to you that's what we've agreed to them with the charter and what the law allows for and so um, that's what they've asked for that's what we've agreed to that's what we're recommending to the board yeah I understand that's what you agreed to but from the position of the university am, am I am I here is that non-negotiable at 35 percent? This has been a university priority since before I got to the university. So right. I, I'm not in a position to start taking a step back from that. Can I just add something? Because I've been at the table with them from the very beginning uh, when the first original application came in. And so even with the previous chair of the Board of Education, our esteemed senator, one of their, their requests from the very beginning was to have a catchment area for the school. The law didn't allow it when they first opened up their charter school. Um, and, and so um, folks who, who represent charter schools around the, the state lobbied, and there are, there, are, there are charter schools around the state that have catchment areas right now as a result of the law being amended. And so um, their, their original request has been substantially modified. So, What was the original request? Originally, when they first proposed the school, it was to have a catchment area that included a preference for, for university employees. Um, because they were trying, at that time, I think uh, part of their purpose was to try to get more employees to live in Prince George's County. Because as you stated earlier, you're one of the few uh, University of Maryland employees who actually lives in Prince George's County. So there was a, so one of their requests was to give a preference for University of Maryland employees. That obviously is not allowed under state law and they're not requesting that anymore. Um, initially there was a request to look at College Park Academy to have it be housed in within the municipality of College Park and to give a preference for those people who lived in the College Park boundaries. And again, if they did that, it would not meet uh, the guidelines associated in the law for having a geographic uh, catchment area. And so it's substantially modified. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think it's better uh, than what was an issue with that 
um, what was initially requested, but I think you can get a whole lot better. And my kids in South County and kids in Central County deserve um, that. All right, thank you. I see uh, no more slips in, so we will put before you uh, to put item 9.4, I believe, uh, uh, before you as first reader. All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed, say no. Can you call the roll? Roll call's been requested. Call the roll. On the motion, Ms. Ahmed, to accept 9.4. As first reader. As first reader. Because I'm on the fence, I'm abstaining. I'll abstain from this. Mr. Blocker? I am also on the fence as well, so I'm going to abstain. Ms. Boston? Yes. Mr. Burroughs? No. Ms. Hernandez? Definitely yes. Mr. Murray? Abstain. Mr. Valentine? Aye. Mr. Wallace? Aye. Ms. Williams? Yes. Dr. Eubanks? Yes. Six eyes. Six eyes, one nay, three abstentions. Six <laughs> Uh, that your phone cannot vote on on this. We obviously give, yeah, given that we have a number of folks uh, absent, and this is a recommendation uh, for the uh, from the CEO. We did not get the um, seven vote majority, but uh, we got more than the one third for the CEO's recommendation. So, what's the ruling on this, Mr. Luch? So the motion was to. Um, approve and it failed it came short of a majority of the board so it remains a first reader um, on the board's next agenda until it's approved to become a second reader all right well so we come back to this as first reader at the next meeting correct that uh, is uh, um, unappetizing uh, ruling, but it is what it is. I'll accept it. I don't know uh, um, any different. So we will this will be back at first reader, and maybe we'll have a full board at that point um, to be able to see uh, when and how we can move this forward. So um, that motion does not carry. We'll move it forward to the next meeting. And so I will move on to you have an objection to the ruling of the no, vote? No, no. Well, can I, can I speak to the motion? For about? About the vote to be suspended. Uh, let's, we'll, we'll be back on the next next meeting. So we got, we'll have, we'll, it looks like we'll have at least two meetings worth. So let's move on uh, well, to the next, the next I'm action. Buzzing in. Yeah, is it, because the discussion's done. So we'll move on to it for the next meeting. I just wanted to say to the College Park folks, I want to work with you um, I support what we you're trying to that. do. They believe you. They believe you. I, they, you said that, and I, and I believe you too. They believe you. So, Thank absolutely. You. Yep. All right. Um, we'll have follow-up items for the April 6, 2017 board work session and April 12, 2017 CIP meeting will be posted in board docs upon receipt. Uh, and colleagues, and item, uh, I would like to take a motion. Uh, to approve items taken in the executive session on Tuesday, April 25th, 2017. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve actions taken in the executive session as it relates to administrative matters, personnel appointments, and board's attorney's report. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed. Thank you. That motion carries. Colleagues, may I have a motion to adjourn? It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed. Thank you.